The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. Hello, hello, everyone out there. So, are playpens Montessori? And I recently heard someone say that, no, they, they are definitely not Montessori. There might be some, you know, rare outlier, but no, you should not have your child in a playpen. I thought that was interesting that this individual was saying that. So I was like, how would I tackle this question? Well, the first thing I'll say is I have my own child who's just turned 11 months, Ragnar. And it's interesting that we have a playpen. I'm almost 20 years in Montessori. I've got this playpen out there. And I just saw somebody saying playpens are not Montessori. Oh my gosh, what do I do? I, do I have like an existential crisis in my life? Like what, what happens at this point? So what I want to do today is give you a couple examples, uh, one from my own life and then one, another one, and then talk about this question and see, you know, my take, maybe your take, how we should approach such questions, you know, is X or is Y Montessori? So first example here. Uh, my wife and I sometimes will do different activities with Ragnar. Um, and then if there's like, say, some cleaning around the house, we might switch off with it. This particular day happened to be that my wife was vacuuming and I'm doing my thing in the room. I think probably the door was shut. Who I, I don't remember exactly. But as she's vacuuming, there's a question here. Ragnar has his own room where not his completely his own room, but most of the room is his. Uh and usually he plays in there and sometimes he can play. I mean, I've seen him play 30, 45 minutes, sometimes, I mean, the rare occasion, almost an hour on his own. And he's just enjoying the, the little items that we have in there. It's not like bogged down with toys or anything. And it's also not, you know, so skimpy that there's only two toys specially placed for him. You know, it's a, it's a room that he enjoys and we try to uh, ensure that he can be active on his own at times. So anyways, he had been in there for a while, but now my wife was going to vacuum and he no longer wanted to be alone. Now it's my time where I'm kind of working on my, my own. It's my wife is with Ragnar, whether he's, you know, working alone or she's doing something with him and so forth. So he doesn't want to be in the room alone. She has to vacuum at this time for whatever reason, the vacuuming had to get done at that time. What do, what do you do now? She could carry him, you know, hold him while she's vacuuming. Um, Maybe she could do some other activities, but we have a little playpen. So she put him in the playpen to watch her as she vacuumed. And then as she moved around the house, she'd pull the playpen you know, around and he could watch her vacuuming. So he kind of can, could be with her, see her vacuuming at the same time. And he's not frustrated that, you know, I don't want to be alone and I... I and nobody cares about me, so they're not paying any attention because my wife's somewhat paying attention. She's around him and he's observing her vacuum. So... Is that Montessori or, or are we kind of skimping on the Montessori? Like what, what's happening there? I'm curious your take. And I should say, judge away. You know, I know there's a big concern about judgment these days. No, don't judge. My whole take is judge away. We have to judge. Is this a good or bad thing for children? Or maybe somewhere in the middle, you know, who knows? We, we have to make decisions in life and choices and figure things out. And that's really judgment. Um, I think we kind of get it confused with judging people maybe too much or without enough, you know, reason. Oh, she's a horrible person. or She's a great Montessori mom. Like I stay away from that immediate judgment because usually you need a lot more context to, to make such judgment. So I'm saying judge the situation away, please. Um, do you think it's good, bad? You think she could have done something else? So forth. Okay. Another story. This is a different type of story, but it involves a playpen. So Audrey, two-year-old girl, her mom, one night, um, she's home alone with Audrey, and the mom realizes a new show on Netflix, okay? This is a made-up story, so I don't know what the show is called. Maybe Ce Celebrity Housewives uh, under under 35. I don't know, something something like, oh, this is binge-worthy stuff. I got to watch this. And Audrey's mom is just, I got to see this whole show. It just came out. You know, Netflix just dumps the shows. You can see like 20 in a row. And she just starts watching the show. Now, her two-year-old is there. She has her in a playpen right next to her, right? And she's playing with some toys. But like maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes into the, sh into the first episode, 
Audrey starts to act out. Ah, she's upset. She wants mom's attention. Mom gives her some pettings. Hey, Audrey, you'll be good. And then she gets right back into the show. Because, you know, if you've ever been in sucked into a show, you know, you're in that show. You don't care if it's your two-year-old, or your husband, your wife, whatever. You, you want to watch the show. You don't want to deal with the distractions. So she pats Audrey on the head and Audrey's kind of happy for another five minutes. And then she's upset again, right? So this time what she did is she moved the playpen, this is Audrey's mom, so that Audrey could also watch the show. So now Audrey is in the playpen watching this housewife show. So that's the use of a playpen. And I don't know how the story ends. I kind of just made it up. But let's say four hours later, Audrey's passed out in there and the mom is still binging this show. We don't know when Audrey fell asleep. The mom doesn't know because she's so engaged in this binge watching. So question for you. Is this Montessori? Our playpen's Montessori. Again, no, no judgment on your part here. You know, you're not good or bad depending on your answer, but I do want you to judge. Is this a good uh, situation with a child? Again, you're not saying Audrey's mom is a horrible human being or what, whatnot. You're just saying, is this good for the child? What's your take? Okay. Uh, so I've given you two situations with playpens. And the question is, are playpens Montessori? Now, hopefully you can see that these are two very, very different situations. They're both involving playpens. Both were trying to figure out, are, is this Montessori? But the point I want to get across here is instead of like, oh, we really have to figure out exactly about playpens is that in any question we ask, context is king. What is happening in the situation? I think a lot of people today, um, especially online and in our culture, it's difficult. We want, you know, that this is the answer. We want the Ten Commandments. We want the rule so that we can check off the box and say, okay, I know the rule. No play pens. Cut them out of my list. I'll never have them. Or if you're on like kind of like the route, like, oh, well, you know, play pens are fine. I'm going to buy a play pen and just throw my child in there. Whatever your your sway is, it seems today that people want a yes or no. And what I would say with Montessori at a core level, it is not about yes or no. It's about us using our judgment as human beings to figure out, is this good or bad for the child? Um, Actually, you know, in this question, are playpens Montessori? There's a very important question within that question. Well, what is Montessori? Because we're saying our playpen's Montessori. Well, it subsumes the question, what is Montessori? So Maria Montessori called her approach the child's method. Like that's literally what she called it in the beginning, um, which is basically meaning look at the child. It's the method that the child is showing us, what we discover by observing the child. So I think we really need to start at Hey, are we looking at the child in front of us? Now, if you want a full on, you know, what is Montessori? Uh, I'm not going to go through it here, but you can go to YouTube and look up literally what is Montessori. Uh, if you want to search with my name, Jess McCarthy, you'll probably find a pretty significant video. It goes over what is Montessori. I focus on three of the main elements, observation, practical life, freedom within limits. There are other fundamental elements of Montessori, but those were the three I chose there. And you can do a little bit of a deep dive. But for now, I just want to focus on the observation element of Montessori, which again is at the foundation of everything that we do. Montessori thought of her approach as an aid to life. That's how she put it, literally an aid to life. So you observe, you figure things out, and am I aiding the child's life or am I being an obstacle to his life? Uh, so Maria Montessori didn't think of it as, is this Montessori? You know, is X or Y Montessori? She, you know, she just used her own eyesight. She used her own mind. She used her own research. She looked back and she tried to figure things out. So what I want to do today is just say, we need to get back to that. Not get wrapped up as, is this Montessori? Does this, is this in line with Montessori? We need to get back to, am I using my independent judgment? Am I observing the child in front of me? Am I aiding this child or am I becoming an obstacle? Um, I'll just give you a very quick, very simple, very immediate example of this. Uh, say you're on a crosswalk. You're walking, green light. You've got, your, got a couple of children maybe. Maybe you're going to the park with your class um, or you have your own child, you're going to the park. 
green light, you can go. Now, most of us, we don't just see a green light go and we just go because we know that people can be nuts at times. So me personally, I always have my head on a swivel. I'm looking both ways. I'm looking around me. Is there anybody being nuts? You know, any car? And sure enough, there's a car speeding towards us, even though we've got a green. So what do I do? Do I go, well, I am, I am a Montessori teacher. I'm actually, I'm a Montessori parent. I need to think, what action should I take to be in line with Montessori? Like, is that how I approach this situation? I mean, of course not. I mean, first of all, I'm observing. There's a car coming. I see I'm with a bunch of children and I have a body and I don't want to die. So I grab the children and I get the heck out of the way. Right? So I observe and then I act or I adapt to the situation. I would say by pulling those children out of the way and myself, I'm an aid to their life. Right? I'm not being an obstacle. I'm an aid to their life. So that is as simple as it gets, right? Now, of course, dealing with children is much more complicated than that immediate situation. So we learn things about children. We, we learn universals about children. Maria Montessori spent her life trying to understand the child better. She came up and she discovered all sorts of things. She discovered sensitive periods in children. They are they have different abilities and strengths at different periods in their life. Um, she observed that children have an absorbent mind, or she discovered that, that they just absorb everything. Whether you, you want them to get it or not, they're absorbing it. So, you know, if you're running around the house cussing at, you know, some you know significant other or some other child, they're going to absorb that, <laughs> whether you want it or not. Um, she, she discovered that mixed ages with children is much more advantageous than just having children all in the same grouping of age. One-year-olds with one-year-olds, three-year-olds with three-year-olds. She saw that children with mixed ages could learn from one another, whether the older one teaching the younger one or the younger one learning from the older one. There's all sorts of advantages here, and these are universal principles. However, at the foundation is this idea that we first have to start with observation. So I'm just getting back to that kind of framework when we think about these questions. We don't want to be thinking about them in a second-handed kind of um, dogmatic way that, oh, are they in line with Montessori or not? So that's, that's where I'm coming from here. Now, again, I could dive deep into Montessori philosophy, Montessori's approach, all sorts of different principles that come with Montessori, and they are so helpful to our observation. Because sometimes if we're observing something and then there could be another person observing something and they see two totally different things. You know, take my son Ragnar. So I observe him uh, making some grunting sounds and somebody could be like, oh, what's he doing? He's having fun or something. And I'm like, oh no, this boy needs to go to the bathroom. And I actually pick him up, take his, if he has um, a diaper on, take his diaper off and actually place him on the toilet. And he poops in the toilet at 10 months old. So I've learned that some, even at a very young age, they can learn to poop on the toilet. So when I observe this grunting sound, I take an action that I think is going to aid my child's life. Whereas another person that they had no clue that children can use the toilet at such a young age with some help, obviously, they might not start, quote, potty training or helping their child to use the toilet until two years old. So they're observing the same thing I am. Um... However, they have a different action. So I don't want to get across that observation is everything. We want to use the principles that we learn in our life and in Montessori in particular because they've been proven over and over and over again. But at the again, at the baseline, somebody had to come up with the idea or to observe, wow, children can really learn this at a young age, um, which actually leads me to something else, by the way. I get a lot of emails that say, oh my gosh, I, my parents raised me Montessori but I never heard of Montessori. My parents had no idea what Montessori was. You know, it's kind of interesting. What do you mean they raised you Montessori, but they don't know what Montessori is? And I think what's happening here, well, I know what's happening because, you know, we get into conversations where I can understand their email, is that they're saying that, oh yeah, my parents uh, had us doing all sorts of chores as children. Not like punishment wise, but we just took care of things. So if my, if my dad was folding laundry, I was folding laundry with him. Uh, if we were eating dinner, I was cooking with them. Uh, if we had to clean up outside when we came in, well, I, my parents didn't just clean up. We all cleaned up together. Or if we were the ones playing, my brothers and I, we cleaned up and came in the house. So there's this sense that, you know, kind of in Montessori, be practical life, doing things that aid your own life and are, you know, day-to-day -day things, taking care of yourself, putting your own clothes on, washing your own hair, setting the table for the family. Some families, maybe even your own, 
that's the way that you guys just live. So it, it isn't necessarily, quote, Montessori. It's just that this was aiding children and some families used it. So again, I want to get away from the focus on this kind of, um, we're a part of a group. This is Montessori or it isn't. Is it aiding the child or is it not? Now, it might very well be in line with, quote, Montessori, but at a core level, we're interested in the benefit of the child's life. All right. So with all this said, why would somebody say that playpens are not Montessori? Like, where is that coming from? Because it's not just one person. There's a lot of people who think playpens are not Montessori. Now, I could just start going off. These people don't know Montessori. They don't know what they're talking about. Maria Montessori would roll in her grave, uh, roll over in her grave. Is that the way the way you say that? Anyhow, but that's not my style. I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. And what I think is happening, I'm pretty sure is happening, is a big part of their thought that a playpen is not Montessori is that it limits movement. And in Montessori, movement is, I mean, at again, it's one of those foundational elements of Montessori. So the whole idea is we don't want children just sitting in rows of desks or sitting still while a teacher lectures at them because we as human beings learn through our movement. If we can't touch things in the world, if we can't taste things in the world, if we can't smell things, if we can't move about in our environment, we really can't understand the world around us. So that's a, a kind of core Montessori concept. Um, she put it like this. Let me grab this, the wording from her. Okay, quote, watching a child makes it obvious that the development of his mind comes about through his movements, end of quote. And she has all sorts of passages about the usage of the hands and how they aid the mind aid our development. And anybody who's observed children, whether you're a parent or teacher for any length of time, you know this. I mean, you know that a child's not going to learn much if he's just sitting there all day long staring at a screen or if somebody's yapping in their ear. They need to be moving. They need to be active. However, movement is one part of a larger puzzle. It comes in context. Movement as such on its own is not good or bad. It has to be within the context we're talking about. Um, a, a good example, I mean, a, a horrible example, but comes to mind. If you Google Nazis and children, you almost assuredly will find something with like young children marching, let's say seven, eight, nine, up to 14 years old plus, who knows, marching with swastikas on their side and they're, they got happy face. They're ready to, to, to do anything for the Fuhrer. You know, they're cheering Hitler on. They've been taught to move in a certain way to defend or to promote their ruler, their Fuhrer, their Hitler, right? Is that good movement? Would we say, oh, that's Montessori because it's movement? No, of course not. So movement has to be thought of in context. So playpens, it's seemingly less movement. However, if we step back and think about it, children sometimes, all they want to do is observe. They don't actually want to move. Um, and that's kind of weird, right? Like, but, but we want children to move. But children also learn from observing their surroundings, just like we learn from observing our surroundings. So if you, if you are a Montessori teacher or you know of a Montessori teacher who has any experience in the classroom, I'd say at least a year, but the more years you get, the more you see this, you'll find that every now and again, a child will start working on an activity and you look over, you're like, wait a second. I didn't give that child that lesson. You know, so let's say it's the pink tower, this, this two and a half year old, maybe, maybe three and a half year old is building the pink tower. And you're like, but we never showed her the pink tower. How is she doing that? Well, she, how she's doing that is she's been sitting on the sidelines observing older children, or maybe children who have already accomplished it before her, building the pink tower. She hasn't you she hasn't moved about with that pink tower. She's never picked up the blocks before. She just sat and observed other children doing it. And now guess what? She can build the pink tower. If you don't know what the pink tower is, Google pink tower. Big big block at the bottom, tiny block at the top, 10 of them stack up, that type of thing. Uh if that child had not sat back and observed that beforehand, a very young child would have a lot of difficulty doing it. But because of that still observation, focused observation, she was able to do it. So imagine if you had a playpen and maybe it was an area where it's at your house and it's a little bit dangerous for the child to be crawling around or walking around. For a moment, 
you said, you know what, let me set you in there and they watch you do something. They can really gain from that, you know? And now if they're wailing, like, get me out of here, you know, something's up because you're observing them. Maybe this playpen isn't the best moment for this person right now. And by the way, on observation, I want to give you a great passage. I, I saw this a while back. This woman is Silvana Montanaro, very famous Montessori and passed away a few years ago. She was very, very old. Um, but here's what she said, quote, in relation to ob observing, quote, children who live in circuses or in other environments where they can observe adults moving in specialized ways, such as a very, as very young girls in Seville and in Egypt who can do the flamenco or belly dance, amaze us by their motor abilities compared with those of other, quote, normal children. But this is merely the result of observing persons performing such movements and observing them from birth. What appears exceptional to us is merely normal to them because it formed part of their environment. The infants absorbed what they saw, then tried to reproduce it as soon as possible and had their efforts encouraged and approved by the people around them. End of quote. Okay, so observing us adults, and in the case of a classroom, maybe other children doing activities, it's huge. It's huge for children. I would much rather see a child, let's say a dad's out like, I don't know, chainsawing some trees down, and he knows he cannot have his child, at least at this moment in the child's uh, developmental level, out there freely walking about with him. So he says, you know what? Jimmy or Sally, whatever the baby's name is, the child's name, I'm going to place you in this playpen while I cut down this tree. Watch from afar what I'm doing. I'd much rather have that child in that playpen or that safe area watching that dad do something that's really productive. And he's really putting his, his effort into it as he's, he's talking through each motion he's doing for the child, but the child's in a playpen. I'd much rather see that than a child in a room, say at his house or in a Montessori school, where a teacher is so overly focused on just the materials, where the child's active, he's moving around the materials, but it's just so focused on materials and not real world experiences. So I'd much rather see that with that dad and the child in a playpen for a short period of time than a child who's overly focused on materials in a classroom and not getting any real world experience, okay? Now, I'm not saying it's either or. There are incredible Montessori classrooms with beautiful materials, and they do get outside every now and again, or they attempt as much as possible to bring in real experiences, um, you know, all sorts of practical life activities that are really awesome. So I'm not saying it's either or, but I just, you know, given that strong contrast between, oh, there's movement in this classroom, so it's Montessori, versus, oh, no, they've got, this, this dad has him in a playpen, so that's not Montessori. So hopefully you guys can see what I'm getting at. I'll give you another quick little paragraph for, and this one's from Maria Montessori. This is again about observation. This is about a young child, just how important just sometimes chilling and observing is, whether you're chilling in a playpen or you're chilling in a larger area, but you're not moving as much. You're just looking. So here's Maria Montessori quote. I knew a nine month old child that wished to see a piece of brown marble every day. This piece of brown marble was set in a brown wall. There was very little difference between the marble and the wall, but the child was very interested in it. Every day the nurse took him near there to let him look at it. There was nothing attractive about it. It was just a stone and very much like the brown wall in which it was set. Yet the child delighted in it. Even before he realized the age of 10 months, he liked the difficult work of distinguishing between two shades of the same color that were so nearly alike. It is not easy for people to realize that a child likes hard work. End of quote. That's from a lecture in London. I forgot the year of that one. Um, I can't get it for you now. But anyways, I'll, maybe I'll post it on the site when I post this uh, episode. Did you hear what she's saying, Maria Montessori? She literally said he liked the difficult work. And the difficult work was observation. He's mentally working. It doesn't mean he's moving around through the room. He's all over the place manipulating something. He's just using his mind to distinguish shades of the same color. So what I'm getting at here is that mental work, that child's observation can be work as well. Just as we often do active work, we're moving, we can also be still and observe, do a lot of mental work. Uh, it actually reminds me of, I had this student once way back when I was doing kind of relatively traditional school and you know, all the, all the children were getting homework at the time. This was elementary, like fourth through eighth grade. And some of the kids were just having way too much homework. And 
And it was just like, why is one child had no homework? Another child had like two hours and was feeling stressed. Um, there's a whole another topic with homework and some of the challenges around that of giving homework. Uh, in, in Montessori, homework is rarely, if ever, given. So that's a whole nother topic. But anyways, so this one girl, Gabby, she had filled out this form that we had the children fill out to see how much homework you're doing. And she had filled it out, but she she came in and she was she looked at me and said, Miss McCarthy, I'm a little confused. Um, When we write down how much homework we've done, like, you know, 25 minutes or whatever, does does work in our minds count as homework? So you get that? She's asking, it kind of, threw, it's, I, I kind of got thrown back. I was like, wait, what is it? What? But she was saying, when I'm thinking, when I'm thinking about a problem in math, when I'm thinking about what to write in literature or history or whatnot, does that thinking count as time that we're doing homework? And what what happened there, and, and I think it's connected actually, is that she had in her mind, as some of us said, that no, homework is really when you're writing things down, when you're filling out math problems on a piece of paper, when you're showing your work, when you're writing that paragraph or that essay. But thinking takes time. Thinking takes effort. So she was trying to figure out, is that is that considered homework time? I just thought that was so, so fascinating, man. Anyhow, just another example of, that movement can never be thought of outside of a larger context. Is this aiding the child's life or is it harming the child's life? Is it being an obstacle to their life? So we've got to think of all of this in context. Movement, mixed ages, freedom within limits, um, the sensitive periods of a child. Is this your own child? Or is this a classroom full of children? Is your child two years old? Are you putting your seven-year-old in a playpen? You know, there's so much context. So it's, it's kind of strange to say this, but I would not answer a question. If somebody asked me, are playpens Montessori? Jesse, you've, you've been in Montessori for so many years. You lecture on Montessori. You give talks on Montessori. You were trained three to six and Association Montessori International, the one started by Maria Montessori. You, you know all these different people in Montessori. Some of them have passed away. Some are young. Some have been in it 50 years, some five years. You have so much experience. Please tell me the answer. Are playpens Montessori? You will never hear a yes or no answer from me because I, I don't think that's the right way to approach what we're up to when working with children. And I hope, I hope you see what I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, by the way, it's kind of funny thinking about this whole thing. I was like, I was taking a walk around my house one day and I was like, you know, this playpen issue. I started thinking about it. And I said, what's kind of funny is some of the people that are kind of quote anti playpens in one context, because maybe this person has a one-bedroom house, maybe a studio, maybe a two-bedroom house. Their whole house is a playpen when compared to a mansion. Let's say I was so rich. I had so much land. I had 20 acres for my child to run around on. There's 15 bedrooms for him. He can, exp he can go around, adventure with his friends, his mixed-age friends. And then I look at this. Oh, my gosh. You live in a studio? You live in a one bedroom? What do you have in a thousand square feet? I've got 20 acres. Your house is a playpen. Do you see what I'm saying? Like even the idea of what a playpen is has some context. How big is this quote playpen? You know, they make all sorts of things now. This playpen could be the size of a house. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, point here being, let's always get the context. Let's always get back to observation. Let's always think for ourselves before trying to figure out, is it Montessori? Let's try to get back to basics and say, is this aiding the child's life or am I putting an obstacle in front of this child? That is it. Now, let me tell you, I know I have not covered everything. I know I have not hit on all the points. I know there's some that's going to be pro play pens, anti play pens. I don't think you're doing it right. I think you're doing it amazing. Who knows? But that's why I have pushback. If you disagree with something I've said, send it my way. Put a comment on this video or wherever it's you, you are listening to it. Or write me personally, jesse, J-E-S-S-E, at montessorieducation.com. And on that note, if you are enjoying this podcast, if you like this episode, share it with friends. Do whatever you want with it. Just get it out there. Same with the, the overall show. Like The more you help reach other people, the more this show gets out there and people learn a little bit more about Montessori and about aiding children. Thank you to those who are already living, leaving reviews, sharing it. You guys are awesome. You're what makes this podcast happen. You're what makes it spread. I appreciate you. 
I'm not going to go as far as say I love you because I don't know most of you. I know people are like, I love you. I don't know most of you. I can't, I can't say I love you. <laughs> anyway, I'll be a little bit silly at the end here. Uh, it's been fun being with you. Again, reach out if you have any questions, comments, suggestions on future episodes. And of course, if you have any pushback. Uh, take care, everyone, and adios until next time.